on today's World Inside. The Olympic spirit shining through as the Tokyo Summer Games sign off. The triumph of human resilience and perseverance over adversity. And the Delta variant adding fuel to a pandemic blaze that never stopped raging. How could scientists collaborate on this serious public health inquiry? A think tank report comes out in China today to set the record straight. Personally, I've been getting some hate mail from bar owners saying that I was demonizing bars uh, when I was just really speaking about the increased risk and need to wear the mask. This individual society, uh, you, you know, one size doesn't fit all in the U.S. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Against all odds, playing out in the shadow of the pandemic, the Tokyo Olympic Games wrapped up on Sunday. Team China ended up with the second most medals in the Games. Congratulations to them. Besides China's success in medal tally, Chinese audiences were glued to the spectacle just like many around the world. They are also glued to the drama and inspiration that unfolded in these unique games. The Olympic spirit was a shining beacon in rather darker times, touching sports fans worldwide, including the cheering millions in China. How will these games be likely best remembered? What are the most important takeaways besides the medals? Our panelists from different parts of the world come in with their conclusions. For more on the Tokyo Olympic Games, we are joined in Washington, D.C. Lisa Nerotti, Director of Sport Management Programs at the George Washington University School of Business. What a pleasure to see you once again, Lisa. And in New York, we have Mike Vaco, who is the sports editor of the DailyNational.com. Last but not least in Beijing, Paul Dong, co-founder of EI Asia Cultural Business in Art and Sports. Welcome to both of you. What an Olympic Games, even though it's much smaller in in scale, the performances of the athletes are absolutely dazzling. Lisa. Yes, I mean, it was went off more successfully than we ever expected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most important is that athletes got to compete and perform to their best and have that international exchange. And you saw so much uh, fair play and sportsmanship and friendship between the athletes. and. That's what's so inspirational about the Olympics. Yes, indeed. Uh, and Mr. Baco, I mean, this is after years of delay. And also, the athletes have had hardly any chances to compete against each other, particularly the top ones. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about the Olympics, you think about this idea of the Olympic ideal. What does that mean? It means that these athletes are going there and competing for their country and competing in what for many of them is the purest form of their sport. You think about so many athletes that go there like a Simone Biles in gymnastics or some of the swimmers like Katie Ledecky, who will be name brands after they leave the Olympic Games. But there are so many athletes, 95% of these athletes compete in sports and are athletes that you don't even know who they are except for this two and a half week period of time. And that's when they shine. That's when not only the people of their own nation get behind them, but when you hear their inspirational stories, everyone yeah. watching rallies around them and even the other athletes that they're competing in rally around them. And this year with this Olympic Games that have been put off for a year, that's what it really was. Paul, you know, every athlete that I've talked to over the past few weeks and their coaches, they said they really cherish this opportunity. Yes, indeed. For, for many of them, uh, Tokyo 2020 would be you know, a lifetime oppor opportunity to realize something that they designate for themselves, uh, especially those athletes in China who don't necessarily have uh, a wonderful life outside of you know, training and competing. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, many of them, most of them feel very lucky that their particular sport uh, finally sail through the entire challenge mm. because at the beginning of the of the games 
even uh, you know during the opening ceremony and after it, nobody was a hundred percent sure that all sports would proceed on time, and there was yeah. a there was a chance that any of it could be suspended. At Lisa. You know, you talk about the sportsmanship, and that is really shining, particularly this year, uh, with, uh, you know, p what people around the world are watching. Uh, tell me one or two moments that you remember the most. Well, Simone Biles cheering for the Chinese gymnast. You had the two gold medalists that they were, they had to choose between doing a runoff or sharing the gold medal right. and they chose to share the gold medal mm. yeah you had a saudi arabian playing against an israeli and you know they shook hands they played fair yeah. everything went well uh you had um you know athletes multiple times where they would trip each other fall down and they lifted each other up and completed the competition in a time when people talk so much about the geopolitics that is a, a moment that we realize Actually, the world has not changed that much as the media once portrayed. Sure, I, you know, the media wants to have the, the athletes competing and making it out as if it's a life and death type of situation. And that's why so many people had that visceral reaction when Simone Biles decided to step back. There were some segments of the media that said that she was a quitter, that she was letting herself down, her country down, her mm. teammates down. Here's the thing though, those same teammates rallied around her they understood what she was going to mm. through those same teammates were the first ones there that had her back and spoke to the media about what a good teammate she was how they had all went through something like that it's something called the twisties where a gymnast doesn't quite feel comfortable with what they're doing and she was very open and speaking about some of her mental health issues so mm. when the media looks at this competitive nature at the olympics what they really also should be looking at is also the the team aspect of it even though all of these right. athletes are there trying to win the gold they're also all there to support each other you really sh saw it shown through with the u.s women's gymnastics team mm. paul of course there are a lot of stories about that too uh, i mean about chinese athletes performance you know whether the media is really catching the right moment or they're trying to exaggerate certain moments exaggerate certain emotions while at the same time playing down other emotions and moments you know uh, what is the role of the media this time you used to work as a media person in sports and now you're an observer tell me more about your your takeaway uh, well Tian Wei, you know we worked together you know sh shoulder by shoulder in 2008 and okay. now uh, 13 years after that in Beijing uh, so much has happened has you know has changed in the landscape of media coverage uh, in this internet age uh, you know social media playing uh, such a big role mm -hmm. now in, you know, influencing, if not the athletes' attitude toward their own competitions, mm -hmm. but at least their fans and, and the, the, the general uh, public's uh, attention or interest mm -hmm. in those particular competitions. A bit different from them, I, I pay a lot of attention to, to uh, you know, Naomi Osaka and, and Simone Biles, and I pay so much attention to athletes mental health uh, this time around different mm. from all previous editions and uh, I yeah I, I I try to interpret a little differently from what the Chinese people uh, are doing and but I, I think it's a good experience for this for those teenage uh, gymnasts who were you know approached by vials and embraced by her they were a little surprised and unprepared but now it's a it's a very very useful experience for them so that they can be more ready uh, for such interaction next time around. Mm. There are a lot of moments that the Chinese athletes went through that actually impressed me a lot. I don't know whether I could relate to you or not, uh, Paul. For example, you know, the Chinese swimmer, women swimmer, came up to the Japanese uh, women swimmer because the latter was suffering from cancer before the Olympic Games. And the, Jap the Chinese swimmer said, I'll see you at the Asian Games, which we know will be held one year later. So it was, it was a very touching moment. A lot of people did not interpret that because they didn't know what the Japanese swimmer went through and what that hug really mean. But, but you know, if you know the real backstone story, it's really something. If you look at, you know, uh, 
Gongli Jiao, who is a shot put a women athlete from China. She won the gold medal, but she went up to a winner who is from New Zealand, and she greeted her and congratulated her because the latter uh, has a family and children, and she went through so much in order to be at the Olympic Games, Tokyo 2020. So it seems that there's a lot of respect athletes showed to one another. Not to mention, you know, the Chinese uh, badminton player, Chen Long, together with his uh, Danish counterpart, uh, uh, Victor Axelsen, uh, who were fighting against each other in such a fierce way during the final, and the Chinese uh, uh, athlete lost uh, eventually, but the two were very much good friends because the Danish player was in China doing the training and they exchanged their shirt. That moment was very much appreciated. I mean, you look at the sportsmanship that's shining at that moment, despite of what the media is trying to portray it. It, it really makes me very touched, Lisa. I don't know, how are you feeling about those moments? Mm. Well, I must say, these are the first time that I've watched the Olympics on television versus mm. being there uh, since 1984. And I've cried more watching it on TV than I've ever done before, just because of the media backstories that I hear about these um, hardships and the friendships and the, right. you know, fair play and the sportsmanship. So I really do believe the media does try to capture some of that human interest. Uh, if I had it my way, we wouldn't have a gold medal count. Uh, I think that you know, that's not what we're looking for. We're more interested in those athletes being able to achieve their greatest performance. Absolutely. And for entertainment. And sometimes we get caught up in, in those medal counts. Mm. How do you see that medal count, uh, Mike? I mean, if you look at the final medal count, medal tally, the U.S. 39, China 38 in terms of gold, uh, and other countries follow up. Yeah, ab absolutely. When you look at the, the gold medal count, 39, 38, the U.S. pulling ahead just in the last day of competition with yes. some of the, the newer sports coming Women in. Women volleyball. So a very, yeah. Very, mm. ve yes, a very, very strong showing. Uh, for the Chinese contingent, and as you mentioned, for the Japanese contingent, U.S. outstripping everyone in terms of uh, total medal count. But going back to what you were saying about this sort of sportsmanship mm -hmm. and people pulling for each other, one of the other things that you really have to think about is so many of these athletes know the struggle that their other competitors have gone through. When you're a shot putter, you're a high jumper, or a long distance runner, or one of these non-glamour sports, you're doing it because you love the sport. You know what it's like to train, to be there, to go through that the mental and the physical rigors to actually be able to perform at the highest level. And once these games are done, people kind of put you into the background. Yes, Simone Biles and the gymnastics team or the swimmers or the U.S. men's basketball team, they're going to be famous long after these games. Mm. But when you actually look at the true Olympic ideal, it is some of those sports. Like you right. mentioned, the, the moment where we said, hey, we'll see you at the, at the next games or we'll see you uh, at the next competition. It's because they have grown up together and they've competed against each other and they want to win, but they also know the struggles that each of their competitors have right. gone through. Let me ask you about the medal tally. If you look at the U.S. at 39 gold, the China 38, the Japan doing as the host country doing the best job in its uh, Olympic history. Uh, Paul, how do you see the competition in terms of numbers? When it comes to this edition, we have to acknowledge that, you know, the two powers have very, very few uh, disciplines to compete against each other for a gold. China only needs to do well good enough in their own expertise events, while the U.S. to make sure that they, you know, uh, d deliver their promises in their own uh, powerful events. But this time around, it seems that China is probably the least affected in terms of training and preparations uh, during the pandemic time. Yeah. But the U.S. team seems to be somewhat more affected. Do you think pandemic. so, Lisa? Well, we know COVID hit China first and they were able to shut everything down and then kind of get back to normal 
in China, whereas in the United States, it shut down and it took us a lot longer to get mm. back to doing anything. And I understand that the Chinese really figured out how to allow their athletes to continue to prepare in a very focused fashion. Whereas we, our athletes were just all split up, right. trying to do the best they could from their homes. I mean, working out on their own, over the phone with their coaches, et cetera. So it was difficult for most athletes around the world. And, and you can only imagine what it was like for third world countries or you know, less yeah. developed countries, you could say. That's why the athletes are so much uh, in mutual appreciation of one another because they really understand what they went through and what the others also went through. Yeah, there's one other thing I'd like to say about the medal tally. If you really look at it, overall what's happening is there's a great expansion of who is getting medals. I mean, you've seen more countries get their first medals. You've seen more countries get more medals. So the Philippines, Qatar. Mm. So you're spreading out that medal count as well. That's a great point. It seems that uh, uh, we are having some changes in terms of how the medals are being located. Uh, uh, what is your observation, Mike? There is a changing of the guard just in terms of that. The, the just spending the most money, having the most infrastructure is not always going to get you the most medals. The USOC would love to have that. Everyone go to Colorado Springs and train there, but the pandemic cut that off as, as we were talking before. A lot of these athletes have to train on their own. A lot of these athletes couldn't train with their coaches or with their other teammates. So when you are getting into some of these specialized sports, all you do need is to have that one up and coming person who might not have been on anyone's radar, but had the ability to continue training or had a good two week run in a particular sport or understanding, uh, you know, how to, how to make their way in that particular field and in that particular sport. I think we see it in a lot of sports where the main dominant uh, nations and teams raise the level of other teams. The U.S. men's basketball team lost some games leading up into the qualifying round and, and the actual tournament. It's because that 1992 dream team set the stage for so many people to mm. get into basketball all around the world. And now the U.S. is challenged every year during the Olympics, even this year with a virtuoso performance by the great uh, Kevin Durant. They still only won by about four or five points. So, right. so the U.S. and the dominant teams and the dominant nations raise the level of everyone else. You might not see it uh, in the particular games, but you'll see it in subsequent games to come. And I think that's what you saw this. Year. You do see that also in some of the strong categories that China had earlier, for example, badminton, Dongjin, uh, that, uh, you know, you see a lot of upcoming players from different parts of the world that actually are doing really good. Table tennis, even though China got most of the titles, but you also see players coming from different parts of the world. Some are not necessarily traditional strong, but really they are getting much better, Paul. Yes, indeed. I, I think that's uh, that's the credit that we should pay to the Olympic Games itself mm -hmm. throughout the uh, history, because those Olympic uh, success stories inspired some smaller nations or uh, smaller territories, especially, for example, in Asia. They gradually realized that uh, maybe the fastest way to be able to qualify for the Olympics, especially mm -hmm. when the Olympic Games comes to an Asian country or a city, uh, people or young people from some Southeastern Asian countries would very naturally and logically pick up badminton, uh, table tennis, mm. because uh, they, they know that not only Asian people are naturally maybe good at uh, practicing such games and uh, try to shot to uh, the Olympic level, but at the same time, it's more convenient to have some of the world's best coaches mm. help them from a neighboring country. Very true. That's, I, I, yeah, that's what we what we witness in badminton table tennis. And yeah, yeah. Other, there are a lot of trainers uh, coming sports. to China over the years, isn't it? Uh, that that uh, many of them have managed to get into their national Olympic team. Amazing performances from every one mm -hmm. of them, and also they are great friends from the also from uh, of the Chinese athletes off the court. They are, you know, uh, great friends and they're speaking even Chinese because these trainers were earlier in China, Paul. 
<laughs> yes, indeed. I, I think uh, the general Chinese public or our audience may catch that very easily. But at the same time, we also need to uh, realize that more and more Chinese athletes are speaking English True. <laughs> with their foreign coaches. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's very helpful, and that will happen. We will see more such, you know, cases during the Winter Games because yeah. China so far has been so much dependent on international help or coaching mm. uh, to help Chinese athletes to first get to know the sports and then learn the basic skills. Yeah. And it's so much relying on international coaches. Su Bing Tian, for example, the Chinese runner for 100 meters dash uh, has a foreign coach. Uh, so are the Chinese women swimmers. You know, their coach is uh, uh, earlier the uh, world champion, uh, but now has uh, vowed earlier to have one gold medal for China, Team China, and he did. Uh, it's, it's amazing all of these stories. So once again, how do you see, you know, the issue of national pride vis-a-vis -vis the rise of nationalism, uh, Lisa? You're not going to get away from nationalism. I mean, we're all very proud of our countries. And, and for TV and commercial rights, that's a big part of it. It's part of the draw of getting people <laughs> to watch the game. Right. You know, let's see if our country will win. Mm. Uh, they're the ones who put up the medal count. It's not the IOC. So, you know, we have to understand that, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. But what we, what we need to do is remind people to, of the great friendships and the camaraderie and mm. the sportsmanship that is most important and to highlight not just our national athletes that are doing well, but to focus on some of these other really important mm. um, friendships that we've seen off the air. That's not the gold, silver, and bronze medalists, but some of the other athletes. Yeah, Mike? I actually think that what we're gonna see in the upcoming winter games might be indicative of the true Olympic spirit when it comes to the, to the viewers in a sport and in sports where the US doesn't traditionally dominate as well as they do in the summer games. And, and mm. Paul mentioned it earlier, how so much infrastructure and coaches are being brought in, especially for the Beijing winter games, because the Chinese people really haven't participated in those sorts of sports. Mm. So it's gonna be interesting to see how the US and NBC covers the, the 2022 Winter Games coming up. And it's also going to be interesting to see how the U.S. follows that Winter Games in, in sports where we're not traditionally dominant. Are they going to be watching for yeah. the love of the Olympics and the pageantry? And certainly it'll be interesting to see whether there'll be audience there, whether there will be spectators, and whether those opening and closing ceremonies will have more of that. Mm -hmm. Paul, what about that question? the sense of national pride vis-a-vis -vis nationalism. Of course, these two concepts are very different. I suspect that most of those who are, you know, really hot pursuing okay. such ideas or concepts, they don't follow sports very closely. They don't pay attention to the, uh, the details of each competition. They don't I follow see. the human stories, you know. They just count the medals. And, and try to engage in, uh, you know, meaningless debates, uh, disputes all the time. <laughs> so I think if we can uh, portray, relay, and narrow the Olympics by all the details, the human stories, the human details, right. that will help us cure the disease. And people will be concentrated on the game itself, on okay. the beauty of, uh, of human nature behind those competitions. Paul Dong, Mike Bako, Lisa Naroti, thank you so much for joining us. You're watching World Insight. Coming up in the program, the emergency of Delta variant is adding fuel to a fire of pandemic never stopped raging. How could scientists collaborate on this serious public health inquiry? And how can they be steered away from politicization? A think tank report comes out in China today, once again trying to describe challenges. Welcome back. This is World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. 
As the coronavirus spreads to new hosts around the world, the emergence of the Delta variant, thought to be twice as infectious and deadlier, is adding fuel to a fire that has never stopped raging. The world sought answers to its origins, but geopolitical tensions get in the way of scientifically uncovering COVID-19's beginnings. It's valuable work which could help prevent future pandemic. So how could scientists collaborate on this serious public health inquiry? And also, how can it be steered away from politicization? What to work on the Delta variant? A Chinese think tank report came out on Monday trying to describe these challenges once again. A nearly 70-page long report on the truth about the U.S. fight against COVID-19 has been released, compiled by researchers and scholars from three major think tanks in China, including one based at Beijing's Renmin University. The report says over 600,000 Americans have lost their lives to the virus due to the mismanagement of the crisis, pointing out some U.S. media still rated the country number one in the world for its pandemic response. Uh, ridiculous, absurd example is the Bloomberg and other reporting that, you know, on a ranking, COVID resilience ranking, the United States uh, comes number one. I mean, this is really, this is. This, is, this can't be taken seriously. COVID-19 was probably the greatest test of governance the world has seen since the Second World War. The report also argues that the U.S. is undermining the global response to the pandemic by allowing the virus to spread in its borders and around the world, worsening the situation. That's the content of the report. But comparing to the academic summaries, the Delta variant is spreading like wildfire and needs real solutions now. So let's loop in our panelists who are real scientists. For more on the latest challenge uh, to the world, uh, the Delta variant and the global pandemic, we are joined in New York by Jeff Slagmelch who is the director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University's Earth Institute. In San Francisco, Peter Chin Hong, professor and associate dean for regional campuses with the School of Medicine from University of California, San Francisco. Last but not least, in New Haven, Xi Chen, associate professor of health policy and economics at Yale School of Public Health. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to see all of you. Things are getting very challenging. Uh, Jeff, I understand that more than 100,000 cases every day, Delta variant in the U.S. right now. Yeah, and of course, these are just the cases that we're able to confirm through testing, and it's believed to be much higher than that. And what we're seeing in the U.S. is, is parts of the country, the states where you have lower vaccination rates is where those positivity rates uh, are, are both higher and also translating into more severe disease, higher hospitalization rates, and unfortunately higher deaths in areas with higher vaccination. Uh, we're seeing um, still increased in infections, but, uh, but not the same level of increase with the uh, severe illness and deaths. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chen Hong, uh, I understand that the trend, according to some health officials and uh, researchers, is going from the south of the U.S., where the vaccination rate is not necessarily high, to the north now, where the vaccination rate is much higher than the south. How should we understand this? Well, as Jeff pointed out, it all has to do with vaccination rates. But overall, we are not seeing as many deaths in the country as we did in the darkest days. And that's because we've vaccinated more than 85% of seniors uh, in general. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones who were disproportionately affected in terms of hospital resources. Um, and again, you know, although we're seeing a lot of infections, when you look at the vaccinated, uh, highly vaccinated states, uh, it's not translating into a lot of hospitalizations or deaths. At the end of the day, if we have enough resources in the hospital to adequately take care of the people who come in, I think we're okay. But that's kind of bursting at the seams in some parts of the country. Right. I was listening to some uh, specific reports regarding that. Uh, the number of hospital beds in the emergency room is running to single digit, uh, Chen. Uh, I mean, that shows the challenge that the U.S. is facing right now together with some of the other countries in the world. Indeed, uh, some uh, uh, 
uh, states, especially in the South, uh, Texas, uh, uh, Florida, they are running short of hospital beds and largely because of a large number of unvaccinated people. So this is uh, a pandemic, but uh, the pandemic is changing in its nature. It's more of a pandemic for those unvaccinated and uh, for their household family members who are unable to be vaccinated for now. So we see the deaths and the hospitalization are dramatically down among uh, vaccinated. And uh, for those people who are vaccinated, the link between the infection numbers and the deaths appear to be weakening. But for unvaccinated, it's a still a very harsh situation. Mm. Mr. Slagmausch, um, a lot of people were trying to understand the fact that how come you know, uh, the U.S. was, uh, shall we say, the most advanced economy and possibly one of the best uh, uh, medical situations in terms of resources in the world uh, uh, is now still suffering uh, once again in such a way uh, by the uh, Delta variant. Uh, how should we reconcile this, these facts? Yeah, and I, I think looking within the U.S. as well as across the world, it's sort of where you're looking at, right? And as my colleagues have, have mentioned as well, you know, mm -hmm. if you're looking at areas with high vaccination rates, you may see some spread, but you're not seeing that translate into the severe conditions and then other areas uh, where it is. And I think that ultimately comes down at this point to choice, as a lot of people have chosen not to get vaccinated. And there's a lot of reasons for that, some legitimate, some more politicized. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of people have chosen not to get vaccinated early on, and we're hearing stories of folks who are regretting that decision and, and urging others to get vaccinated. And we're seeing increases in vaccination rates after seeing really the damage that the Delta variant is causing, in addition to other variants that are circulating. Mm -hmm. But but it, it really is a, a matter of place in terms of where you're looking at in areas where people have chosen to get high, more vaccinations you're not seeing. Uh, she, uh, we've been talking to each other since the very beginning of the uh, information that there were a pandemic called uh, COVID-19. We see that waves after waves of uh, COVID coming back uh, and also challenging in such a devastating way. What do you think is the biggest takeaway since you are based in U.S. Uh, in the United States of all these different waves, especially with the Delta this time? Yeah, I think one hard lesson is uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. This is uh, true not only globally, but also within the U.S. We see the virus spreading among those unvaccinated. Uh, although there's no immediate um, uh, uh, threat to those vaccinated, but with more uh, mutations, more replications of the virus, this will eventually spill over to the large group of people who are already vaccinated were becoming a threat to all the people in the U.S. And same is true for uh, the, at the global level. And we see that there's a very uh, uneven distribution of the vaccines. And uh, the, for example, WHO's uh, distribution has faced with a supply shortfall. And, uh, and the, the commercial uh, entities, they try to marketing their third dose of vaccines worldwide mm -hmm. without uh, taking adequate care of uh, countries with uh, uh, less, uh, fewer vaccines for the, even the first two doses. So those are all require more adequate and timely coordination among countries. And uh, I think all the policies, if we can follow science better, then we are in a much better situation. So this pandemic taught us that, uh, uh, including something we just discussed about the masking mandate and was uh, removed and uh, reimposed. So those mm -hmm. things are, are taught, uh, teaching us that we should be humble about what we know and what we don't know, and always guided by the science and inflow, uh, information will be flowing and we will learn new things and mm -hmm. recognize uh, errors in our previous understandings. It's very important to uh, correct those mi mistakes immediately after we know that and right. have more effective public communications. So information has to be updated uh, constantly and has to be taken by the public at the time when those information are out. What is that communication, you know, being done in the U.S. right now, you know, between the public and the scientific community, the policymakers, you know, at the 
federal level, uh, state level, and even a lower local level. How is that being done? How come there's so much confusion? Well, I think in a lot of cases when it comes to scientific information, it, it comes down to uh, how is it being used. And for quite a time, it was being used very differently by different political parties. Now, we're seeing some coming together now, not universal, but where the various political parties are all starting to say the same thing, get the vaccine. Uh, but mask mandates, I mean, I mean, the U.S. is a very uh, society very much based on individualism and individualistic freedoms. And so when you tell someone they have to do something, when you tell someone they have to wear a mask, it, it strikes to the core of that. And there are those that reject that. And I think that um, really the best efforts out there are to work with community leaders, work with folks, as my colleague said, you know, masks are a temporary measure. Um, and there is a lot that we do know about the virus. It's when we try to get overly precise or play with the politics of this that we start to get into trouble. Right. Peter. Where a lot of emphasis has been placed on, I think rightly so, is vaccinations. And I think what had dipped in the interim was testing behaviors, uh, emphasis on masking, and, and so on. You know, and now uh, various states are coming back with some of these other almost like old fashioned advice. So I think, you know, people were very optimistic about reopening society. We were thinking that the vaccines would be the way out particularly in some states like California, New York, uh, heavily vaccinated, um, you know, and many parts of New England, for example. Now that you have Delta and you're turning back the clock, this is like a big moral blow, a big psychological blow to a lot of people out there. And so it's leading to a lot of uh, anger. It's leading to, um, you know, mistrust of what public health is saying. For example, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, wearing masks in bars and personally I've been getting some hate mail from bar owners saying that I was demonizing bars uh, when I was just really speaking about the increased risk I need to wear the mask mm -hmm. you know again you're never going to satisfy all parts of th this individual society uh, you you know one size doesn't fit all in the US well, you know, there are so many theories as to why the systems work and the systems didn't work. Uh, there are numerous reports coming out of uh, various think tanks for whatever reasons uh, about the reasons and the, uh, you know, the prospects. But, you know, at the end of the day, it seems that, gentlemen, there's uh, some of the basic rules that just populations have to follow in terms of a public health uh, crisis. I really wonder, there's really that much difference in terms of political systems, economic development stages, you know, any one of these would really uh, matter in front of uh, the virus and a global pandemic. Last year, we thought we could come out of it at the end of last year or earlier this year, and we didn't. And now, looking at the spread of Delta variant, it's very unlikely that we'll be able to do that within this year. So as l long as the time drags on, there will be exhaustion, there will be further disbelief, distrust. Um, how are we going to handle this situation? How are we going to solve this problem? I think, you know, it's, it's so hard way. You know, we have COVAX, we have world organizations coming together, but it hasn't really led to uh, the distribution in a timely way. Again, time is everything with variants, like you mentioned, you know. Right. Sure, we could eventually vaccinate the world, maybe, with some more generics and, uh, you know, uh, sharing of uh, intellectual property. But, you know, again, if we don't do it in time, today is Delta, tomorrow is Delta Plus, then it's Lambda, and then you're going to run out of Greek alphabet letters. Um, it's really difficult since many rich countries are talking about giving third shots, people are getting fourth shots, uh, and then that's not even in all members of these countries. And then you have like some members not even getting it. And then you have 85% uh, of countries uh, with less than 1% of, of vaccine. So it really is kind of bleak, but at the end of the day, um, you know, there are other vaccines in, in progress. Uh, you know, yeah. COVAX is picking up a little bit. It's, it's tough. Jeff? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what I would start by saying is that I, I, I 
I do think we're going to get through this, uh, that we are going to get through to the other side. We are seeing the value of the vaccines. We've actually seen unprecedented speed in development uh, and new mechanisms for purchasing and distributing vaccines. That being said, it's not where it should be. The road out of this pandemic is going to be harder and longer and unfortunately more deadly than it should be. But we have folks engaged from the public sector to the private sector looking at this problem from angles we haven't looked at before with ideas and, and thinking that we haven't had before. Uh, this won't be the last pandemic we face. We face other problems mm. at the intersection of science and social science and hard sciences. Um, but I do think, I, and agree with you, we need to find these sources of inspiration, both to carry us through this pandemic and into the challenges that the future will bring us. But I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic on my end. She. Yeah, I think uh, with this pandemic ongoing and with so many, uh, already one year and more than one year and a half uh, uh, went by and we gradually, all the all the countries are uh, gradually realized that we have to learn how to manage the threat, manage the virus and also gradually step by step by uh, resuming and uh, reopening the economy, social economic activities. So how to do that better to in the face of such a once in a century pandemic? I think at the global stage, uh, countries are at a different phase of the reopening and they have very different strategies. So I would encourage all countries to learn from each other. Thank you so much for every one of you for joining us and sharing your thoughts from an expert's perspective. Uh, Jeff uh, Slagmosh. Peter Chen Hong, Xi Chen, really appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more Search World Inside, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.